when we looked at conduction and convection and we had Q minus Ka dt dx or dr as well as the Q is equal to HA delta T, that's for the convection, we looked at, for example, a slab. And we said that if there was a slab and Q was flowing from hot to cold, so it's going from the left to the right, so that is the Q, we have the K for the slab. We said that the rate of the heat transfer Q depended on the K, the change in temperature, as well as the cross-sectional area. So that is this area that I'm highlighting here in red, not in red, in black. So there are going to be examples where we want to try and cool something down as fast as possible. If that is a solid object, so let's just say this is a solid wall here, there are certain things we can't do and there are certain things that we can do. The first thing is that the temperature on the inside, so the temperature of the hot, we might not be able to change that because that's just a function of whatever's happening on inside. The temperature outside, the temperature cold, we can't change the atmosphere. This is a solid block, so we can't really do much about the thickness of it or change it in any effect like that. We don't want to run liquids over it because there might be electronics. So you'll see in the heat exchanger section, we often use fluids with cold or hot water to cool it. The only one that we have left that we can possibly manipulate is the area. And that is what we're going to look at today. So in order to change the area, we can't go up and down. So what we're going to do is we're going to change the area by adding fins onto it. So fins, we have protrusions that come out of this. So instead of having a flat surface, we are going to have some form of fins on this surface. So we now have the heat transfer area, not only as the yellow, but we now have the extra area of these finger-like protrusions that are coming out. So in that way, we're going to increase the area and thereby increase the heat transfer. So where might we see some of these parts? They're common in industry in radiators or in things like computer parts with small electronics as well as with fans attached to them. If we neaten the diagram up a little bit, we again have the wall on the left and we're going to have the heat flowing from the left to the right. So there we have the Q for conduction flowing into this fin. Labeling this diagram a little bit so that we can understand what's going on, we're going to have the wall here at a temperature Tw. We're going to define the thickness of this slab as W and the depth as it goes into the back which is going to be W for the width. The temperature of this fin we'll call Ts for the temperature of the surface. The ambient temperature around this will be temperature A. And we're also going to have, because this is now a slab and we're increasing the surface area, we're going to include a convective term coming off the slab from the top to the bottom. The way we are going to solve this mathematically is we are going to look at a small portion of this fin. So if I take some point along this fin and I say that this point is at point x, we have some point further along, so at x plus delta x, we are then going to look at the heat transfer as it comes through that portion of the slab, or of that fin rather, from the left to the right in conduction, and then the convection term that comes out the top and the bottom. Okay, so we neaten the diagram up once more, and now let's have a look at how we solve this in terms of an energy balance. Because heat flowing from the left and out on the right is a simple energy balance of an in equal to an out. Before we get there though, we are going to make a simplifying assumption. And that assumption is that we are going to assume that this is a thin slab. So I've got the simplifying assumption there that if we assume a thin slice of fin, and we're going to say that the temperature profile is only in the x direction. So heat is going to move from left to right. It is also going to move up and down. But because the film, or that, sorry, the fin is so thin in this y direction, we are not going to worry about any temperature difference. So we are still losing heat, but we're not going to have a temperature difference. In reality, there is a temperature difference, but because the length is so much longer in the x direction, we are only going to worry about the x direction. 
So the first step is to look at an energy balance. So we've already said that by an energy balance, we're going to have in is equal to out. So in this case, in is going to be the energy coming in at the left, and that is by conduction, and the energy out is going to be at the right by conduction, as well as the convection terms. So there is an energy out at the top and an energy out at the bottom by convection. Now, please remember, we are only looking at that small portion. If I go back up again, the small portion for x to x plus delta x. We're not looking at the entire fin for now. We're only looking at that small portion of this. So back to the energy balance, we said n is equal to out with conduction, convection, left, right, top, and bottom. So if we write this in our units, we now have q at x on the left is equal to q at x plus delta x, which is at the right, the conduction terms, plus the convection terms, and convection was given as h, a delta t. The area is twice because there's a top and a bottom of the system. The w is the length, the delta x is the breadth to give us area, multiplied by the delta t, which is the surface temperature, minus the temperature of the ambient ta. We can also replace those q terms. So instead of writing it as q, we want it in conduction. And conduction, we remember, was q is equal to minus ka dt dx. Using the terms that we have here, we then have at x. So minus ka dt dx on the left is at x. Minus ka dt dx on the right is x plus delta x. And then the next term is the same, h2w delta x ts minus ta. If I look at the areas, so the areas of the conduction term are going to be the areas where this flows through. So the area where we flow through in conduction is going to be the area that I'm trying to highlight here. It's the slightly grayed out one in the 3D form. So it's that block there. So that is equal to the Y, the height, multiplied by the W going along. So it's the same the same form, the same shape as we see on the end of the slab. So that's the same area. So it's the area we'll use y times w. So if we come back. We're now looking at substituting in the area terms. So we have minus k multiplied by the area, which was the y times the w, or wy, which we've now got in the yellow circle. Again, y times w for the conduction term going out. And then the convection term stays the same because we haven't done anything to that yet. Now, the trick in this one is to rearrange and divide by delta x. So by rearranging, we're going to take all of the conduction terms and put them on the left-hand side, and we'll leave the convection terms on the right. So the convection terms are easy. We're just leaving those on the right. The conduction terms we've brought onto the left. So we've now got both of the dt dx terms on the left-hand side. And you'll see we've manipulated the negative signs there slightly. So we want the x plus delta x on the left-hand side of this term and the x on the right-hand side. If you remember on the convection term, we did have a delta x. So you'll see there's a delta x that's moved down to there. But because we are now dividing by delta x, that delta x will cancel. And we have a delta x on the left-hand side. Okay, so once we get to this point, most of this is now maths from here on afterwards. There's only going to be one little piece of engineering information, but the rest is going to be maths. So having rearranged and divided by delta x and being left with this form of the equation now to write, we are going to take the limits as x tend to zero. So it's exactly the same equation, but we are going to take the limits as x tends to zero. If we take the limits as x tends to zero while we divide by x and the two terms on top of this are the same for a distance between x and delta x, that is the definition of the derivative. So we're left with a ddx, because we're taking the limit as x tends to zero while dividing by delta x, of the minus k wy dt dx, so that's the one term on the top line as we've got it on the screen, and then that is equal to minus h 2w ts minus ta. In this example, and only because it's going to become very complicated if we don't make this assumption, we are going to assume that k is constant. 
So k could be a function of the temperature, but that, as we can see, there's a dt. We don't want to integrate with respect to a temperature for k, so that's why we're assuming k is constant. We can then bring the d dx in, leave the k constant, and we're now left with a form of the equation of minus k wy d squared t dx squared is equal to minus h 2w ts minus ta. A simplification on that, we can get rid of the minus signs. So let's just put that on the top of the screen. So if you see there's a minus on the left, we can multiply through by negative and we'll change the signs on both sides to a positive. So we've got that. Dividing through by w on both sides because that is a common term. Moving things around and getting rid of some of the brackets, we are now left with a simplified term of ky on the left, d squared t dx squared is equal to 2h times by ts minus ta in the brackets. Okay, one of the assumptions that we made, if you recall, was because we said that the slab was much longer, the length from left to right was much longer than top to bottom, we said that we weren't worried about a temperature profile in the y direction. So because there's no temperature profile in the y direction, the temperature throughout from that in the vertical direction is going to be the same. We define that as Ts. So because Ts is going to be equal to T, we can take our most recent form of the equation and replace Ts with T. So in the next step, that's all that I've done. Ky d squared T dx squared is equal to 2ht, so I replace the Ts. The next step is just to move everything onto the left-hand side. So we've got d squared t dx squared is equal to 2h on ky t minus ta. And this final form of the equation, as I've got it here, is often going to be part a of what I'm going to ask you in the tests or exams. Give me a form of the equation as a d squared t dx squared is equal to something. So this is going to be often part A of your exam questions, and I need you to be able to get at least to that to pass the question. Okay, so having come up to this point, we said was part A of most of your exam questions that I will give you in this course. From here on out, there's going to be maths. So if you're not sure about this maths, you should have covered it in either first or second year maths already. If you're not sure about this maths, I suggest that you speak to your maths tutors about the logic and the, the thinking behind this. The first step, though, to solve these questions, and this is for a d squared t dx squared term, we're going to let theta equal t minus ta. So that will end up being substituted into that second half of the equation there. The next thing is that we also want to define a term m, so small m, and we're going to put that m as the square root of 2h divided by ky. So you'll see we have a 2hky term here, but we are going to have this as the square root of that. So now, if we place this, and the reason why we have a square root is that when we substitute it into our equation that we said was part A of the question, we end up with a d squared theta on dx squared equal to m squared times theta. And if we've got that for a squared term, or a second derivative, we can now use the d operator and solve that as d squared minus m squared theta equal to naught, or d minus m d plus m, both in brackets, times theta is equal to zero, and that becomes a c1e mx plus c2e minus mx. So as I say, if you're not sure about that, please go and double check your maths on how we got a d, d operator from a double derivative. The next step is going to look at what are the constants. So these are the constants that we have in our previous equation C1 and C2. And to get those constants, we are going to have to look at the boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions can be seen as what happened, what information has the question given us that we can use in our integral limits to solve for those, con those integral constants that we've got in yellow there. There are two common boundary conditions for fins. So I've just simplified this as BC1 and BC2, so boundary condition 1. So often at x equal to naught, so we're no longer looking at that small portion of 
the black section in the diagram, we're looking at the entire fin. X equal to naught is at the wall. Theta will equal to theta 1. So theta, we said, related to temperature. So here it is in the middle again, temperature minus temperature A. We will know what the temperature is at the wall, often. So it's the known wall temperature, the known temperature at the wall. It's one of the more common boundary conditions. The other boundary condition that I'm going to assume in this question, that boundary condition 2, is that at x is equal to 1, d theta dx is equal to 0. So looking at the fin, we had a wall, and I'm just going to do it in 2D here. The x is going from left to right. L is the point at the very end of the fin. A good fin, an ideal fin, the change in temperature at the end of the fin will be 0. So what that means is that we start with T hot on the left at the whatever this wall is, and the temperature will slowly cool down along the length. So let's just draw an XY diagram. So the temperature will cool down until it gets to the end, and that will be at a stationary point. And that stationary point should be the ambient temperature. If the fin is too short, so a non-ideal fin, let's just say the fin is too short, the end of the fin will not be at ambient temperature. So if it's not at ambient temperature, we could have made it longer. So it's not an optimal fin. If this fin was theoretically longer than an ideal fin, we've then got section of material where there's actually no heat transfer happening. So the fin has cooled down to ambient temperature at point L. Anything beyond L is just wasted space or wasted, wasted fin. So for this example, we're going to assume an ideal fin. And this ideal fin is that at the end, at L, we have reached ambient temperature. So ambient temperature, that means there's no more change in temperature. So that's why we say that at x equal to L, the yellow highlight, there's no longer a change in temperature. So theta, remember, was the change in the temperature. Or just simply, the temperature has a stationary point at x equal to L. There's no change. Okay. If we then use these boundary conditions, so from boundary condition 1, we can now say that theta 1 is equal to C1 plus 2, so that is simply substituting the values into our previous equations. So from boundary condition 1, theta 1 can be solved for C1 and 2. From boundary condition 2, we can also solve using d theta dx is equal to 0. So there we can see that the d theta dx has become 0, and we've replaced x with L. So we're simply substituting that at x is equal to L, d theta dx is equal to naught. We're substituting those values into the values for the equation that we solved previously. Okay, we're taking the, the values into there. Simplifying it, we can get C2 is equal to C1e2m. C1e to the power of 2ml, and C1 is equal to theta1 divided by 1 plus e to the power of 2eml. The following lines are simply maths, so I don't want to go through all of them. So once you get C2, you can substitute it into theta. You can then expand it into that form of the equation, a second form of the equation, and then you can simplify for theta divided by theta 1. This step here from theta divided by theta 1, in an exam, I will be happy for you to leave it as something like that. If you happen to realize the corresponding cosh m cosh ml value, please do include it. Okay. I'm not going to spend much time on that because this is in the notes and there is a link to that on the site. However, the last step. At some point we had said that theta is equal to t minus ta and m is equal to the square root of 2h divided by ky. We now need to substitute these values back into the final form of the theta on theta 1 that we had. So we therefore have t minus ta divided by t wall minus ta. And we now have h's, k's, y's, and l's. Typically, the question will be, what is the temperature along x? So we want to put t's on the left-hand side and everything else on the right. So the final form of the equation will be t is equal to t w minus ta in brackets, multiplied by a cosh term over a different cosh term plus the ambient temperature.